Hi, it's Dwyer from richarddwyer.com. I'm an attorney in Northern California. Um, also, I run a blog, a uh, political blog, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let's talk about a event, an alleged crime that's gotten a lot of play in media, right? It's been featured on shows like Dateline. There's even been a series of movies, right? The Staircase and The Staircase Part Two. It involves Michael Peterson, right? Let me point out to Peterson ultimately entered an Alford plea where he didn't admit guilt but he admitted that there was enough evidence to convict him, right? But with a wink of the eye, he still maintains that he didn't do the crime. And of course, his kids swear by him, at least his kids from a prior relationship. Let's go through the case. I want to debunk a defense theory that has gained some popularity Make no mistake, I personally believe Michael Peterson is guilty of premeditated murder, right? I believe he thought this out and did the crime. As I watch these crime shows and as I see him, I view him as a sociopath. Now, as I said in my intro, the opinion you should follow should be your own. But let's go through the mistakes he made, at least some of them, at the murder scene that, to me, point to clear guilt. Now, let's just start the case off with the telephone call. It's the morning of December 9th, 2001. Michael Peterson calls 911. The operator answers and says, Durham... 911, where's your emergency? Michael Peterson responds, 1810 Cedar Street, please. Operator, what's wrong? Peterson, my wife had an accident. She's still breathing. Operator, what kind of accident? Peterson, she fell down the stairs. She's still breathing. Please come. Right now, the prosecution got the guilty verdict but made some mistakes. Right? Let's just highlight the mistakes. Number one, rather than focus on the scene of the crime, right? The facts of the case, they paid too much attention to the fact that. Michael Peterson was bisexual, right? That Michael Peterson may have been living a double life, right? In my opinion, whether he was or was not is irrelevant, right? I feel that that was a distraction that has clouded clear thinking on the case, right? Another mistake the prosecution made was they focused on him being the last person to see another woman alive who was found the next day bloody at the bottom of a flight of stairs in Germany, right? Her name was Elizabeth Ratliff. Now, don't get me wrong. That information is relevant. It shows custom and practice. But it really shouldn't be one of the first cards you play. It shouldn't be what you emphasize because there's more than enough evidence here at the crime scene to convict him of murdering his wife, right? And of course, another mistake the prosecution made was the blood evidence expert lied about his experience under oath, right? I agree as a lawyer that that's grounds for an appeal, right? 
If the state's going to convict you of murder, they at least need to tell the truth under oath. You can't have, you know, prosecution witnesses lying under oath, especially when they're experts, about their level of expertise. Now, let me just say this. After he was convicted, his team, and apparently some neighbors, came up with the theory that maybe his wife was attacked by owls, right? The argument is that she's outside, she's attacked by owls, their talons rip apart the back of her head, she runs into her house, and then of course, somehow falls down a flight of stairs, right? May have gone upstairs, then falls back down the flight of stairs. The owls really are responsible for ripping up the back of her head, but she does fall down a flight of stairs. And of course, Michael Peterson had nothing to do with either the owl attack or her falling down the flight of stairs. Let me just point out that this theory has gotten far more run in the media than it deserves. Because understand that Kathleen Peterson, the victim here, had a thyroid cartilage fracture. Right? Her thyroid cartilage is fractured. In my opinion, somebody put their hands around her throat and caused that fracture. The owls didn't cause it. It's unlikely she would get that kind of fracture, which is commonplace in strangulations by falling down a flight of stairs. Right? Also, Michael Peterson, who is outside, doesn't claim to have heard, no one claims to have heard any commotion about owls attacking Kathleen Peterson. So let me just say in the comment section to this video, if you feel that the owl theory is actually a viable theory, that it accurately explains this crime, then please tell us exactly how the victim fractured her thyroid cartilage. Is that just a strange coincidence in a case where, if I'm to believe that the defendant is innocent, I would necessarily have to buy into a series of strange coincidences. Well, let's talk about the mistakes that Michael Peterson made that night, right? December the 9th, 2001. The first mistake he claimed twice in his call to police, his 911 call, that his wife was still breathing. Right? Understand, he claims he was outside. His wife, who had to go to work the next day, said bye, went inside. 45 minutes later, he goes inside. She's at the bottom of the stairs. And according to him, She's still breathing, right? You should know her blood alcohol level was 0 0.07, right? Marginally legally drunk. Well, understand, the evidence doesn't conform with Peterson's statement to the police that she was still breathing when he makes the 911 call. In fact, the evidence shows that she had been dead for 90 minutes to two hours, right? Understand the victim's blood doesn't match defendant's timeline. She has a small number of red neurons in the gray matter of her cerebral cortex and her cerebellum, right? Understand the people who introduced this evidence aren't the discredited blood splatter expert who lied about his experience. No, these are different experts and what they're saying is that the red neurons 
in the brain of the victim showed that she had been dead for some time. She's not still breathing. Right? She had been dead for some time. She had had decreased blood flow in her brain for two hours. Let me point out, too, that when the police and paramedics showed up at the scene, they noticed that much of the blood had already dried. Right? They showed up quickly. Supposedly, she's still breathing when the call's made. But yet, when they get there, much of the blood is already dry. Right? Now... Let's just ask the obvious question. Isn't that consistent with the finding that there are not many red neurons in the victim's cerebellum or her cerebral cortex? Is this just a strange coincidence that by chance there are not a lot of red neurons, but somehow she magically was still breathing when the 911 call was made by Michael Peterson and that by chance, when the police and paramedics showed up, the blood just happened to look dry. Let's talk about another mistake Peterson makes. The police show up and Peterson is barefoot. Right? He's barefoot. But yet there is a bloody print from his sneaker on the back of the victim's sweatpants. Right? His sneaker print is on the victim. Now, this was discussed at trial by state police evidence analyst Joyce Petska. Right? Understand, again, she's not the blood spatter expert who lied on the stand. This is a different expert. Right? This is a different expert. In fact, she's a different expert than the experts who testified about the victim's red neurons. Right? Understand, the prosecution had a lot of evidence. Just know that when the cops show up, Peterson's barefoot. But of course, somehow his sneaker is on the victim's body. And from what I'm hearing, the sneaker print was in such a way that the victim's body would have had to have been moved, right? Apparently the sneaker is close to facing the floor. Let's talk about a third mistake Peterson made, and this might be the biggest. The victim's blood is found on the inside of the pant leg of Peterson's shorts. Now, according to experts, this is not the kind of blood stain that would be left by leaning over a dead body, right? Rather, this suggests that he's standing over her during an attack where there's blood blowback that splashes on him, splashes up inside his pants, right? Now, as you hear, Peterson, of course, explain away a lot of the evidence. What's his explanation for the victim's blood being inside the leg of his pants? Let's talk about another mistake Peterson made. There is blood on the soles of the victim's feet. In other words, at some time, Kathleen Peterson was standing in the blood. Now that's inconsistent with her falling to her death down a flight of stairs, right? There wouldn't be blood on her feet. She'd be bleeding at the bottom of the stairs. But yet here there's blood on her feet. Now, to get around this, the defense is claiming that maybe she fell down the flight of stairs. 
and then stood up at some time during the incident, right? That Michael Peterson's outside having said goodnight to his wife, right? She goes in the house. The defense claims something like 45 minutes lapses. During that 45 minutes, and again, that's inconsistent with the red neurons in her brain. But during that 45 minutes, we're to believe that she falls down the flight of stairs, perhaps due to having had some alcohol earlier that evening, right? 0.07, but alcohol. That at the end of the stairs, after having gashed the back of her head, right, disoriented, she gets up, stands in the blood, and then falls back down where she's found at the bottom of the stairs. That's what the defense wants you to believe. Another scenario would have her not falling down a flight of stairs, her being attacked, and the attack being such that she ends up standing in her own blood. Let's talk about another mistake Michael Peterson made. You know, the injuries on the victim are too localized, aren't they? They don't fit the narrative of her falling down a flight of stairs. There are seven lacerations, seven, on the back of the victim's head. Five vertical, two horizontal. Some of the lacerations are bone deep. Right? She's hit hard, folks. Bone deep lacerations. There are also wounds to her face, and there's the neck fracture that we talked about earlier that suggests she was strangled. Now, understand a fall down a flight of stairs, while it's somewhat unpredictable, is really a full body type of event, right? Your body is falling down the flight of stairs, especially if it's violent enough to give you these kind of bone deep lacerations. Right? Your body's bouncing around. Not a part of your body. Your entire body would be bouncing around as you tumble down a flight of stairs. But yet here, the injuries are head injuries, aren't they? Right? Lacerations to the back of her head. No other lacerations. Right? These are head injuries. There isn't enough body bruising on the victim to suggest that she actually fell down the flight of stairs. Right? As she's falling, okay, she hits the back of her head. You're telling me that she doesn't hit an elbow, uh, you know, break a rib, uh, be wounded up, have internal bleeding on her body? No, right? The wounds are localized. Let me also say too that the wounds are so close together. Think about it. We're talking about wounds on the back of her head, right? When we're supposed to believe that she's tumbling, twisting, turning down a flight of stairs, right? The closeness of the wounds the closeness of them, in my opinion, suggests that her head's not moving when she's hit. She's not falling down a flight of stairs, bouncing around like this. No, right? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? For this to happen on a tumble, it would have to be, I fall one, then somehow my head goes this way, Two, same spot. Somehow my head comes back. Three. Somehow my head turns. Four. Somehow my head turns. Five. No other part of my body is getting a laceration. Right? The wounds are so localized to me that the defense had to come up with the owl theory later for appellate purposes. Right? Right? Not even appellate purposes. I'm not sure if they even raised the owl theory in court. 
I believe that argument is solely for the court of public opinion because the defense understands that the idea that this victim got seven wounds to the same part of her body falling down a flight of stairs and didn't get any other lacerations anywhere else is simply not plausible. Let's go further. Now there seems to have been an attempt here to build a narrative, right? To paint the victim as having been drunk the night of her death, right? She's inebriated, she's not 100%, maybe she fell down the flight of stairs because she was not 100%, because she was a little bit drunk, right? So when the police show up, they see a bottle on the kitchen counter and they see two glasses of wine. Now I'll leave it up to you to decide if this is staging. Neither, <laughs> neither glass of wine has the victim's fingerprints on it. Right? Neither one. Now it's just supposed to be Michael Peterson and his wife there, right? The prosecution doesn't even believe that the bottle was had by the two of them. They believe that Michael Peterson poured that bottle down the sink. You know, he just had it there as a prop to show that they had been drinking. But he made a mistake, didn't he? He didn't remember to put her prints on either glass. Let's talk about another mistake he made. Now this is controversial because the blood spatter expert lied on the stand about his experience. Right? But there's evidence that there was an attempted blood cleanup at the scene. In fact, it's so bad that on one step, there is dried, smudged blood that looks like someone tried to clean it up. And then there's fresh blood on top of that. In other words, this event might have happened in stages, right? Just understand that there's some evidence at the scene that suggests an attempt to clean up some of the blood. But understand the problem. This is the next mistake Peterson made. There's too much blood at the scene. Even his expert, Henry Lee, from the OJ case, had to concede that there was 10,000 drops of blood at the scene. 10,000 drops. Now, Henry Lee had a theory, right? Because the blood clearly couldn't have come from just the lacerations. So Henry Lee felt that she had coughed up blood, right? Coughed it up. The problem is there isn't a lot of blood in her lungs. Just to understand the 10,000 drops of blood are excessive for a fall down a flight of stairs. Finally, the body isn't staged properly. When the police arrive, now keep in mind, this fall down a flight of stairs is supposed to be so violent that in addition to fracturing the thyroid cartilage in her neck, the victim has seven lacerations, some bone deep in the back of her head. Right, so this is a very violent fall if we believe there's a fall down a flight of stairs. But yet when the police arrive, her head is lined up perfectly with her spinal column. Right, perfectly. In falls down a flight of stairs that are this violent, where she might not have been conscious by the time she gets to the bottom of the stairs, you would expect to see her head somewhat displaced off her spinal column. 
but not here. Her body is in such a way where her head is lined up with her spinal column. Now let's talk about his motive for doing this. First, understand that Kathleen, the victim, feared that she was about to lose her job. Her employer had had recent layoffs and was having ongoing financial problems. Kathleen apparently was of the mindset that it was over. There was a possibility that she was going to be laid off that very next day. Right? So, understand, in a family where she makes more than him, right, perhaps her losing her job resulted in him losing interest in continuing the relationship. So, there's a $1.8 million life insurance policy. Now, you and I have watched crime shows where people have killed for far less than this amount. I've heard there's been some dispute on whether it's actually 1.8. I've heard in some places that it's 1.5 million. In others, it's 1.4 million. Just understand, we're talking about seven figures, <laughs> right? Sizable, sizable. I would argue that the fact that Michael Peterson stood to gain seven figures from the death of his wife could be construed as a powerful motive for him killing her. Let's talk about something else. The couple, with her on the verge of losing her job, was 143 thousand dollars in the hole on credit cards they were living on plastic now I know he has had great attorneys David Rudolph one of the best attorneys in my opinion in the United States made the argument that the house had equity right that Michael Peterson could have drawn money out of the house why would he kill his wife right but you and I know that, in my opinion, sociopaths think differently than the rest of us. He might have loved his life in Durham. He might have loved having the house in Durham. You pull money out of the house, guess what? You have to pay that money back. You get money from life insurance, you don't. Suddenly, the $143,000 of credit card debt becomes manageable when you get seven figures of life insurance money. So I don't believe the prosecution had to speculate on Michael Peterson's bisexuality. I don't believe the prosecution had to introduce the bisexuality and say, hey, well, maybe his wife wanted to end the relationship because she discovered that he was a bisexual and stuff like that. Why ask the jury to speculate when you actually have a seven-figure life insurance policy screaming you in the face and you have evidence that this family was spending more than it was taking in in the form of a $143,000 credit card debt? So you add it up to me and Michael Peterson killed his wife tried to cover it up, right, came up with a story, placed a wine bottle and two wine glasses on the kitchen counter for the police to see, tells the cops his wife's still breathing, not thinking that the police are going to run a red neuron test and figure out her brain blood flow, which shows she was dead for some period of time not realizing that the police are organized enough where they're going to check with the first responders 
and that the first responders are going to make note of the fact that when they showed up, what should have been wet blood was dry blood. Right now, lawyers are slick. His lawyers were able to get him a new trial because, of course, the blood spatter expert for the prosecution told lies on the stand about his experience. But that doesn't mean that the other experts lied about anything. Right? What about the expert who talked about the red neurons or lack of red neurons in the victim's cerebellum and cerebral cortex? Right? What about the people who testified that the blood was dry when they got there? Let me ask the obvious question. Was there blood inside Michael Peterson's shorts? How come his defense team never discusses that blood? By the way, based on reports, it's impossible for that blood to have gotten there from Michael Peterson simply leaning over his wife after finding her. Keep in mind, too, if the blood was dry when he leaned over her shortly before the police got there, if you believe his timeline, then how would the blood have magically gotten inside his pant leg? Right? Also, isn't it a bit odd? You know, if you find a loved one down and bleeding out, how would your sneaker print ever get on that victim's pant leg? Right? Think it through. Also, the wounds, aren't they too close together on the back of the victim's head for us to believe that the victim got those wounds from falling down a flight of stairs? Now, too much of this case has been reported uh, as the defense discrediting the prosecution's theory that a uh, fire blowpoke did the wounds. Well, whether it was that weapon or a different weapon, aren't the wounds consistent with some weapon being used, some sharp object being used by someone who was determined to hit this woman in the back of the head several times to kill her? Also, doesn't it look staged to you when there's blood on the soles of her feet? Right? So, as all of us watch Michael Peterson on these crime shows like Dateline talk about how he's glad the ordeal is over and how his children told him, look, you'll never get a fair break and things like that, just contemplate the idea that this guy may have killed his wife, tried to stage the scene, then hired high-powered attorneys and has the lack of empathy and has the lack of conscience to keep his lie of finding his wife's body still breathing at the bottom of the stairs alive. Right? Even after the Alford play, he's trying to claim that he didn't do the crime, that he's the victim. Right? Is he the victim or is he a guy who murdered his wife, then tried to cover it up, right? And has convinced his kids that he's innocent. Let me also say too, the earlier murder, the earlier incident, we'll call it here. Let me dial back the word murder. Right, the earlier incident where another woman sees him, then the next morning is found dead at the bottom of a flight of stairs. I believe in that case, the original verdict was that the woman uh, suffered a brain hemorrhage at the top of the stairs and then fell down the stairs 
to her death. Right? Is it possible that Michael Peterson was inspired by what happened to his friend? Right? Not many of us go around thinking, wow, is someone falling down a flight of stairs a way that they could end their lives? Right? I'm guessing Michael Peterson, who had a friend right, the mother of children who he became the guardian for, who had a friend die that way, whether or not he was responsible, may have thought, you know what, if something happens and I need to couch a murder as an accident, maybe falling down a flight of stairs is the way to do it. Right? Just a thought. In any event, whether it's an Alfred plea or not, I believe Michael Peterson was guilty of killing his wife. Right? Understand, here online, sometimes I come across cases where I'll say, gee, I question the person's guilt. I don't question the guilt here. Right? Don't get distracted by stories of bisexuality. Focus on the facts of the crime, right? Why are all of her wounds localized? Why is her blood dry, right? Why are her prints not on either wine glass? How could she have been breathing when Peterson makes the 911 call? Right? I believe Michael Peterson killed his wife. Let me know what you think. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. I look forward to reading them. Thanks for stopping by.